Hi everybody, welcome back. Well, I need this piece of test equipment about as much as I need a new steam shovel. <laughs> All kidding aside though, I've wanted one of these little Ico 324s for a long time. Uh, this is a really simple signal generator and it's for RF, it's for setting up radios like AM radios and shortwave, works really well. And it works from, you can see, down from 150 kilohertz up to, it'll do on harmonics up to 435 megahertz. And it also has the ability to do modulation so that you can uh, put an audio signal uh, to carry it on to the carrier signal. So this thing's pretty useful. And a lot of the older radios that you work on, especially old tube radios, uh, have a process where they want you to uh, rock the signal generator back and forth. And it's really difficult to do with the, these modern digital generators, but uh, works really well with these. So anyway, these are well built and they made a whole ton of them. You can get them online pretty inexpensively still in decent shape and they're easy to rebuild they're easy to align and they're real useful it's just you know if you just need a basic rf carrier with a modulation it's perfect so i've wanted one just uh, to have on the bench and it'll just come up here if we ever do some radios or some things like that it's really handy so if that sounds interesting to you stay tuned and we are probably going to do a couple of modifications to this one since these aren't particularly valuable and collectible i don't mind putting an extra hole up here uh, for an extra connector because i would like to be able to add a frequency counter to it and have a high level output so more about that later in the video Now another thing we're going to do in this video is I'm going to try out my new camera mount to get a couple different camera positions that I wasn't able to get so easily before. And the first one is the ability to do a straight down shot. Uh, so we'll see how that works out. So this is our first attempt at this. And again, kind of getting used to how the new layout of the bench is with the camera stand and everything. As I said before, I'm not a photographer. I'm <laughs> I work on this stuff and I do my best to get the the video to look halfway decent. But anyway, we have this out. Let's uh, get a different camera angle now. Now one thing I notice about this camera stand that I I, you know, I like better about the other camera stand is that this is about as low to the bottom of the bench as I can get, you know, for a straight on shot. And I'm still, you know, the camera is actually up above where we are here and it's kind of angled down. So you kind of get a little bit of distortion on that. That's not my favorite thing in the world, but uh, we'll get used to it. We'll kind of experiment as we go along here. Uh, the other option is I can flip the whole arm around the other way and I might do that. That's that's a thought. Anyway, <laughs> let's keep going here. So taking it out of the case, we can see this one is in really good shape. I just bought this randomly off of eBay, so it's nothing special. But you can see this one's really clean. This is a good example right here. Uh, we're going to have to clean off the little connectors, or I mean the little switches, and that's fine. Uh, it has the Ico marked original tubes, which is good. Turning this over. up a little bit and turning this over we can see 
all the original wax capacitors, so we'll have to change those. These all have to go. Sometimes these dry electrolytics hold up really well, but I'm probably going to replace that, and I'm probably going to replace the uh, selenium rectifier. Uh, going to have to put a new safety cap up here, and then a simple alignment, and then we'll do our little modification. So what do you think we ought to do on this video? <laughs> You want me to just, I don't know, should I just do the recap and come back? Or should we do a solder and chat? Um, I'll, wait, I'll think about it for a little bit, see what kind of time I have. And uh, maybe we will, maybe we will kind of go along and do this and uh, talk as we go along. Okay, I flipped the arm down now. And now I can get it all the way down to the bench, which I really like. And I can also put the camera next to me instead of being in front of me. So we can get kind of an angle view when we work on this. So this might work out better. I just have to keep experimenting, I guess. Okay, I wonder what that was, a little piece of wire. Some of these were kits that were built uh, by the owner, and then some of them were factory built. This one looks almost like a factory built unit. Uh, but you never know. Some people did that good of a job soldering and things, so we don't know. But it does look very professionally done. All right, well, let's get some capacitors replaced because these wax ones, I don't even want to turn it on with them like that. And I'm not really concerned. This is such a simple design that whatever's run, whatever we run into, we'll be able to fix it. Okay, we have the little uh, outside foil gizmo thingy that I built a long time ago, hacked together. And <clears throat> we're just checking for outside foil. Okay, that's not the outside foil. That is. So it's going to be this side. So we'll just put a little stripe on there. Just like so. And we'll go to the next one. This one's not as good as uh, some of the other ones out there. I know Mr. Carlson made one. And I also know Don over at Restore Old Radios made several of them, and they're some really nice ones. Uh, a lot better than mine. So you might want to check their websites out or their YouTube channels. Okay, there we go. Nothing there, something there. Okay, so it's that side once again. And technically, if I flip this thing around, it should move. And you can see now it doesn't do anything on this side, see how it moves up. So now it's switched over to that side. And sometimes the meter doesn't move a whole lot, you know, depending on, yeah, so you can see. So it follows the, the little side that's outside foil. And of course my little paint didn't dry yet, so I'm getting paint on my fingers. But that's okay. Okay, let's replace these things. I'm going to snip this one out. And these probably will read okay still. I don't know, but I'm not even going to worry about it. It doesn't matter. You know, a couple dollars worth of capacitors, who cares? And we're doing this for fun anyway. So it doesn't matter.
use my reach. Okay. These pliers aren't the best for this. Probably should put my microphone back on, huh? So you can hear me. Maybe that's a good thing if you can't hear me, huh? Okay, there's that one. And then this one here. <coughs> we just have to heat it up, I think, because it's just held in there by some solder. I'm just trying to keep it in the camera for you. There we go. Okay, and they had this one in this way, so we will put the new one in like that, 0.1 at 400. Point 0.1 at 400. Well, this one's point 0.1 at 630. Okay, let's take this one out. This is another point one. These caps all look really in good shape for their age. I don't think this thing was used a whole lot just by the looks of it. Which is good. Okay. Oh. All right, that one's ready. We'll do this one here, and we'll check these resistors while we're in here too, because they're old carbon comp. I bet they're going to be okay. There might be a couple of them that drift, but not too many. All right. So grab the, the meter. Might as well while we have this out. It's easier to get in here. I don't know if we can see everything from here. Oh, yeah. Okay, so this first one is 270k and it's reading across a capacitor that works snowflakes in the window work okay checking all the resistors all of these nice little allen bradley ones down here are reading spot on but the ones up here these little roundies there's two that are 47 ohm and two that are 470 ohm. And you can see, for instance, we look at this one 470 down here. And it's reading 614 ohms. And this is actually in the attenuator circuit. So we're going to have to replace those four resistors. So I'm going to go get those right now. Okay, I actually found some original carbon comp in my stash and I, I'm really running out of them and it, the problem with these new old stock carbon comps is some of them are going to be right on and some of them are going to be a little bit high because they drift with age even if you don't use them so but I want to use the carbon comps because this thing's running in the, in the VHF range and some resistors don't like to play well with high frequencies, especially when you use the carbon film or the uh, metal film, because they tend to, uh, th they have those little spiral cuts in them, and they could affect the signal a little bit. Usually they don't, at, uh, even at VHF frequencies, but it can happen. I'm not taking any chances. So I'm just going to use the carbon comp that was in there originally and uh, keep things as is. 
Again, this thing's not a high precision piece of test equipment, but you do want it to work uh, to the best of its ability. And so that's kind of why I'm doing this this way. in here. Those ones don't have any teeth on them. There we go. And then I'll clean this off a little more. Perfect. Okay. Well, might as well do these ones too at the top. And again, if you want, you can you can cut the leads off and just kind of J hook them, you know, hook and pinch. But if you can clean off the terminals and you just have to be careful, you don't want to damage anything. But there we go. Perfect. is a 0 0.022 microfarad. 0 0.022. This would be one of the ones that would probably leak the quickest. Okay. So we'll pop this. And I don't always remember to do it, but if you can orient the capacitor so that you can read it, so you can see the value on it, It'll just make it easier if somebody else needs to come in here and work on this at some time in the future. Chances are they'll never have to replace these capacitors because these Mylar caps just don't go bad like the old foil and wax ones do. But it's still nice to have it be visible like that. Nice. Okay, I don't know if you can see all that or not. Hope you can. Let's do this one now. Is the camera still running? Yes, it is. Good. Didn't even think to check. All right, and this one is the 0 .047 that one in. Right. There we go. Okay. Let's take this out here. I'll crop these off a little bit. Just like so. Tack this one in. All right, let's do these two up here. So, of course, the the babble of the day going on is the video released by Veritasium.
on his YouTube channel. I'm sure most of you are aware of that channel. And he did a uh, video about electricity, how it propagates, and that it kind of doesn't work the way a lot of people think it works, at least the way that uh, non-physicist or even non-engineering types think it works. And it was a pretty cool video, although something that kind of he didn't touch on a lot that I thought he should have that would affect things is when we talk about velocity factor. I mean, people kind of throw that whole term of the speed of light around quite a bit. But really, that speed, the speed which is c, which is, what is it, 300,000 km, 300, kilometers per second or 186,000 miles per second, that particular speed uh, only occurs in a vacuum. So when you're out in space, uh, photons will propagate at that speed. But when we're talking about uh, being in the Earth's atmosphere or transmitting through a uh, conductor such as a wire or you know coax cable or something, that velocity factor actually has effect on that, and it's not traveling at the speed of light. I mean, we can say that it's the speed of light because it's still very fast and very close to that speed, but it's really not. I was kind of surprised nobody mentioned that in any of the comments or anything. Uh, and I know that main, I think the main crux of the video was, you know, that the field around uh, the wires is what causes the electricity to flow. Um, but it's just kind of the way it was done didn't really get into, and I don't think he wanted to get into that, probably because of the target, art, target audience, but uh, it was very interesting. All right, this is a point zero one. Let's see, where's my point zero one? This would be a point zero one. I'm going to put some tubing on that as well in a similar manner to how they did it. Just like so. I'm not talking a lot today, am I? It's not like me, is it? But, uh, yeah. I'm just kind of vegging out today. It's a nice slow day and I have a lot of busy time coming up at work. So I sold uh, quite a bit of equipment this last quarter of this year and we're going to be doing all the installs. And that's going to get really busy. One of them is a pretty big machine. It's pretty involved. It'll take probably a couple of weeks to do. And that starts next week. So, and it's out of town and it's going to be pretty busy. So, but busy is good. I like being busy. It keeps you out of trouble. What's the old saying, you know, the idle mind is the devil's workshop. Is that what they say? So try to keep my mind from being idle so I don't get into mischief. Here we go. All right. And then we're going to have to clean these switches up and then see if this thing even works. <laughs> yeah, I don't... Okay. We'll clean that one off. So you get the point. I'll finish this up. And when we get to the power supply portion, I'll come back. Okay, it's the next day. And I have all the capacitors replaced now. I replaced those four resistors in the, the output pad network. 
and I replaced the safety cap and I cleaned the controls and you can see how well they cleaned up I mean they look brand new so we're down to dealing with the power supply and I think I need to go get the I printed out the service documents for this so let me go get that first okay this is a pretty simple power supply <laughs> it's a half wave rectified and if you look here you have this CR1 and it's listed as a just a rectifier 50 MA and what it is is it's a selenium rectifier so it will have a little bit of a voltage drop across it in addition you have these two capacitors and they're both 20 microfarad and you have this resistor right here which is R1 and that is a 2.2K if I'm looking at it correctly and I see it and it it is dead on 2.2K so we don't have to change that right there so um, all we're going to do going back up here is we're going to remove this screw here the mounting screw for the transformer because if you look that's what holds this capacitor on here and we're going to install this terminal strip and once we do that we're going to put our new capacitors and our new rectifier there and then we're going to move this resistor over to the terminal strip hopefully it will reach I hope I don't have to replace it if so I'll just put another resistor on there but we'll see so that's the plan okay I am going to use this long screwdriver I dug out to get around this because the short ones I don't want to hit the thing here and we will loosen this and that one doesn't fit so I need a smaller one let me get a different one okay this one should fit and it does okay and there goes the washer <laughs> it's all right fell down on the bench okay and we can remove the capacitor here and this one might like I said might be good and uh, while I'm on the subject here of reaching around things um, I'm gonna take a picture with my camera phone and I'm going to embed it into this video to kind of show you something here I'm gonna do this right now while I'm on camera got my phone here and I'm gonna back up a little bit I'm going to show you a typical <laughs> Tony video. So here we are. There we go. Let me get another shot just in case. Okay. Now the reason I took this picture and I'm going to show it to you is so that you can see kind of how I work on things sometimes to get a really good shot of what I'm doing. And quite often now I'm reaching around that camera that I showed you and I'm actually extending my arms <laughs> at an odd angle so a lot of you have made the comment and when I say a lot I mean I get probably about five to ten of these a year uh, asking if I have Parkinson's disease now, Parkinson's Parkinson's is a pretty serious thing to have and uh, for those of you who ask I am very aware of what it is my mother-in-law has advanced stage Parkinson's my own mother does not have Parkinson's but she has what's called essential tremors which is kind of related to Parkinson's but not the same but one of the things with all of these is the tremors that you get you know because people see my hand shake when I'm trying to hold something the tremors that you get are involuntary meaning that even when you're sitting still when you're not doing anything you can get those tremors sometimes especially as it progresses and I can assure you I don't have anything like that what I will share with you is a little bit about my health I'm 
pretty daggone healthy. But I do have two issues. One is that I have arthritis in my C C7 vertebrae, which is kind of right at the base of the neck. It causes me a lot of pain sometimes in my shoulders and things. Sometimes it flares up, sometimes it doesn't bother me at all, but it does affect me, especially when, my, when I'm holding my arms up for any extended length of time. The other thing is, if you look at my hand here, if you took an x-ray right here of this joint, you would see like a big kind of an anvil shaped spur on that bone joint in this arm or in this thumb. And it's from years and years of, of use using crimpers and things at work. And that gets very painful sometimes too. And compound that with reaching around a camera and holding something at an angle, it gets difficult. And sometimes, yes, my hand will shake uh, from that, <laughs> but it's pain based and not neurological based. And I'm not wincing in pain, don't worry. <laughs> I'm not torturing myself, but it does make it a little bit difficult sometimes uh, to work with things like this. Now, of course, just sitting watching TV or sitting at the computer or something, I know I have no problems at all. But things like that, you definitely, you know, especially repetitive actions, like if I'm working in the wood shop, if I'm using a hand plane or a chisel or something, you know, that can get my, that can cause some discomfort in my hand and so forth. So I know it's, a, we're talking about something that has nothing to do with electronics, but so many of you seem concerned and I, I really appreciate that. I mean, the fact that you care enough that you would ask another person that you don't even really know uh, about such things. I appreciate that, but I just want to put your mind at ease. I don't have any neurological, you know, problem like that, that causes that type of, uh, you know, the tremors. I do not have Parkinson's. <laughs> Hope that kind of settles it. Um, you're going to see sometimes that I, my hand will shake a little bit holding something. And you will also notice that the closer in I am with the camera and the more I'm reaching around something, the, the higher probability that something like that will happen. I assure you it's not a problem. <laughs> I can deal with it. So thank you all once again, but that I just wanted to, to clear that up. So let's get back to work. Okay, here's a really handy tool to have for starting screws like this. If you look at it, it's a normal nut driver, but inside, see that little piece in the middle? That's a magnet. So what you can do is you can take the nut that you're starting and it will hold it really nicely and it'll hold it just proud of the driver so that you can reach in there now can get in there around it and around the camera and you get the screw started and there it is so yeah I don't really see these very much anymore I mean this is a really old one and you can see it says magnetic on it so it's a really good tool to have if you can find one of these on eBay used and you can get a picture of it and see that it's not all chewed up on the end you might want to score one of these. They, they're really helpful for things like that. You can also put a, you know, roll up a little piece of electrical tape and stuff down in there, and it'll kind of stick. I've done that, you know, because not every one of these come with the, you know, with the option of having a magnet in them. But just another tech tip there. All right, let's turn this around. Get this tightened up. Oh, you know what I forgot to do? I forgot to put the washer on. It's laying right down here, so let's take it back off, I guess. Okay, there we go. All right, now, what we want to do is we want to remove this capacitor. And I'm just going to cut it out because I'm not going to reuse it. And again, some of these cardboard ones are called dry electrolytics. And they really hold up well. And this might be one of those, I'm not sure. It doesn't say that it is or isn't, but there's, a, there's some that say the words dry electrolytic on them, and I've seen some of those go for a really long time. Uh, 
So anyway, I'm just going to cut these so we remember where they go. And these are both 20 microfarad at 150 volts. So So I'm going to remove this one first. Let's back off the camera a little bit so I can get in here. Try to do this. There we go. And that's the one transformer lead. So that would be this lead going to the diode right there that we're going to replace. And I will put that over here on this second terminal. And the reason I'm going to do all this this way is I want, well, I don't know, if I can get this resistor to go over to here, that would be the best way to do it. We'll have to get that off and see if we can. So let me get in here. Oh, crud. All right. See, like right there, my hand shaking. I am at a really bad angle. And that hurts my thumb right there to hold that. But the price we pay. All right, there we go. I think that's cleaned off enough. Okay, we're gonna do a little change in plans here. I'm going to remove this terminal strip from here. This selenium rectifier is mounted in the same kind of mounting screw as the transformer. If I put that over there, this will go right back into its original place and I think that'll be a lot better layout than what we're doing right here. So I'm going to take this terminal strip out. We're going to remove the selenium rectifier, which does not appear to have the same size. Well, I guess it does. Let me get a nut driver that will fit it. Hold on. Okay. Take this off. Okay, there, and there's your selenium rectifier. Let's see if it'll focus. Model 50, whatever that is. Okay. Okay, I had to put the washer on off camera because I just couldn't reach around there. And then we'll use our little magnetic cheater driver and then that once that screw protrudes through there it hits that magnet and then you got to use a normal nut driver to get in there let's see and then I will have to tighten it from the other side just like so I know I'm off camera, but oh well. Let's see. There we go. Okay. I think that's a lot better in there than it is um, than it was under there. So now we can put this back the way it was, and it, everything will be in the correct place. So we're going to take this and we'll move it like so. I don't think I need any spaghetti tubing or anything. I will be able to cut this down a little bit though. And again, this resistor is just fine. It doesn't need replaced. I'm not going to play with it. As a matter of fact, it was more accurate than some of the, I mean, it was 2.2K on the money when I measured it. 
that's the strange thing about these carbon resistors is one of them will last forever and never change the next one next to it <laughs> you know will be completely drifted out in the middle of nowhere and it just i think it just depends how they were made and and so forth but uh all right here's our diode let me get some pliers and clip these we're just doing a little follow along video not much to learn here just kind of hanging out together huh on a, on a lazy day I'm gonna enjoy my lazy day while I got it because it ain't gonna be lazy after another day or two things get really crazy at work sometimes and it's just nice to sit down and do this once in a while keep telling myself I need to retire one of these days but I don't think that's going to happen for a little while anyway. Kind of hard to, to do. There aren't a whole lot of people that do this sort of work in the x-ray industry, so it's kind of hard to find replacement people to take my place. But one day, we're working on it. I'm actually think, looking into hiring some interns from one of the local colleges. Um, I've hired several interns over the last 20 years and they've all worked out exceptionally well. They're all still in the industry, they're all doing well. Some of them work for me, some of them have moved on to other companies which is good. But the bottom line is, there's a big deficit uh, for people that do what we do. It's not an easy career to get into. It's not easy to get a job initially, but once you get in, if you work really hard, it's a great career path. You have to be the right kind of person. You can't be afraid of travel and laid out long hours sometimes. and being put into a situation where if you you're not allowed to not fix it <laughs> you have to have an attitude that it's not about I don't know how to fix it or it's just it's I'm going to fix it it has to be right and it has to be repaired because well <laughs> the machine's down and there's patients that need to get on the equipment and I have to I have to fix it that's kind of the attitude you got to have towards it. Okay, how are we going to arrange this? We have a nice solid ground right here that we could use. We also have a nice ground down here that we could use as a common point, and I think that's what I'm going to do. I have these radial capacitors. I'd sure like to find some axial ones. Let me look through my other box of caps and see if I can find an axial one. Okay, so I didn't have any axial leads in a suitable size or a suitable value, so I'm just going to use this one with the radio. I just slid some Teflon tubing on it, and we'll try to make it as neat as we can. So we'll bend this one like that. And then that'll kind of make it a poor man's axial lead, won't it? Okay. So go like that. And I'll get that on there. where we're at. Very 
could. Now I'll have to, probably should have cleaned that off first while that was out of the way, but hindsight is 2020. Back this up because we're not going to be able to reach here. Okay. should be enough room for both of those capacitors to go to put the negative leads. Grab this here. straighten the leads out and make them look neat as soon as we get these bent around here where they belong. These aren't really the best pliers for this. Let's see if I have some that will grip it a little better. For those of you who like paint dry, watching paint dry, you're probably loving this video. Those of you who do not are probably cringing. And my question to you is why in the heck would you watch it then? <laughs> that always makes me crazy. People come on and they're like, you talk too much or you don't show, you know, instant gratification type thing. And it, it, all, it never ceases to amaze me that if you don't, like something like that why in the heck do you watch it i would never watch something like that if i didn't like it or didn't or if it annoyed me or something i just wouldn't watch it um <laughs> it's like when i'd go to the store and uh you know my mother or my sisters and they'd go in the store and they'd pick up a dress or some article of clothing and they'd say boy isn't this the ugliest dress you've ever seen I, i'd never wear this i you know they go on and on about it why in the heck are you wasting the time of your life watching or looking at it if you don't like it why are you bothering <laughs> i don't get it so well that's my rant you gotta have a tony rant in every video don't you but uh all seriousness I, I don't I don't get it if you don't like a certain kind of thing why in the heck do you watch it why do you keep watching it I don't know but because uh, there's lots of videos out there that are just like they're cut to the chase you know here it is here's the burned up transistor or the shorted capacitor and here I solder a new one in there it is it's done you know, there's something to be said for that, but, you know, if I do that, I'll just be like everybody else. I mean, how does that help you out? I really don't think it does. I don't know. There's a lot of other smart people out there that, you know, they can do all that stuff and... You don't need another one like me doing it, doing a repeat performance, do you? So, I figure, well, hey, that's how we visit, huh, with one another. By the way, for those of you who don't like that kind of video, there's an awful lot of other people who do. You know, you're not the only viewer out there, so... Can only, can't please everyone, I guess, huh? There you go. This is my fun time. 
so I get something out of it too and maybe that's what it is some other people are doing this for a living and they're trying to get views and clicks and likes and all those things that I don't pay attention to and uh, maybe that's you know that would be good advice for them because they're trying to get as many people to watch as possible so they can get as much ad revenue and so forth and that's important to them because that's how they make their living I mean you know in my line of work I want as many customers as possible too I mean that's how I pay the bills you know it's how we eat <laughs> so just a different different purpose you know and and some viewers they're not they're they don't want to be entertained they want to be t totally educated and uh, well it's disappointing when you want just a strict educational video and you don't get that so I understand their plight but there's lots of books there's lots of colleges there are many other ways to get the education and there's lots of other YouTube channels that are more you know education thing again you look at my channel and it's listed as entertainment because that's all I consider this to be is entertainment for you and we do learn a few things but you know all in all I'm not a real purpose driven you know education channel never started out like that I mean I just wanted to share my hobby which I think I do right all right kind of bend these around so they stay out of each other's way and there's our capacitors and there's our power supply I think we are now finally ready to power this up and see if it works okay we have we are connected to the electronic circuit breaker I haven't enabled it yet we're going to connect our scope to the output by the way, we are on an isolation transformer, but that's not really very necessary because this has a transformer for isolation. This capacitor does not belong here. This also needs to be an across the line cap, safety cap. So let me grab another one and I will put it in there. And I unfortunately do not have a capacitor with long leads like this, so we're going to have to J hook. Uh, the one that I put in there but that's okay okay here's our here's the correct safety capacitor that should be in there but if you notice it's the leads are very short on it and so I'm going to extend the leads and I'll kind of show you how I do it I start out by getting a very thin screwdriver blade kind of like this and I take some of the bus wire and I just kind of wrap it around a few times make sure there's enough length and then I just go around this screwdriver blade several times and pinch it together and drop everything on the floor go and then I'll just snip this like so I just realized that I probably didn't catch any of that on camera <laughs> there we go all right and then pick up the capacitor that I dropped and we're going to place wire over said capacitor and of course I spiraled it too tightly but that's a good thing this will be a good mechanical connection too and that's what we want there we go 
and then we'll just bend this straight. And the idea is you want this to be as tight to the lead as possible so we can slip some tubing over it. And then we'll flow some solder on there. And I'm actually on camera now, which is great. Watch everything fall because I'm not holding it with anything. All right. Got that one done. And see, I'll use a little bit bigger screwdriver on this one. Make it a little easier so it's not so tight. Okay. So. Like that. down and I'll pop this off and there we go if I can see what I'm doing here I know I complain about my glasses a lot, but I have really good distance vision. It hasn't changed since I was 16 years old. I mean, it's been about the same prescription. Um, but as you age, your up-close vision starts going bad. And you can correct it to a degree, but you know, you get to a certain point where anything really tight up close like this even with my new I mean I have brand new glasses I just got them you guys haven't even seen them yet because I haven't been in front of the camera but uh, it's been a while I mean I even these are new glasses and I still I struggle to see up close I have to take them off and then I have to put my face real close to what I'm working on and like they say, getting old sucks, <laughs> but it beats the alternative, as they say. At least I think so. And then, let's see. I'm just going to guesstimate how long I want these to be. I'll put these on here, and if I need to trim them up, I can. And this is just regular spaghetti tubing. This is not uh, shrink tubing. It's very tough. You, it's heat resistant, rot resistant. You know, it won't deteriorate. It's really good stuff. Okay. So out with this capacitor and in with the correct capacitor. And I should have caught that, but I didn't. I should have seen that that was going straight to that transformer. My grandmother was a wise woman. She uh, graduated, you know, she was born in 1908 at a time that women really couldn't do much. And she graduated from high school at age 15. She was that brilliant. And of course, she wanted to be an attorney. That's what was her dream. And of course, women weren't attorneys back then. And uh, my great grandmother had a hissy fit on that. She didn't want her, you know, women are supposed to be school teachers and nurses if they want to work. And if not, they need to be housewives. Well, if you guys knew my mother, <laughs> you know why I, I don't support that theory. Um, <laughs> but my poor grandma never got to uh, have her dream of being an attorney. And uh, anyway, she always used to say, what you don't carry in your head, you carry in your feet. <laughs> you have to think about that for a minute, but uh, 
how many of us forget things or do something wrong <laughs> and then we have to go back and redo it right that's what she meant by that wise woman she was a wonderful person and uh, she was probably a very proud moment in her life was to see my sister become an attorney and I don't think that was planned I think that just my sister ended up in that career path but uh, I know my grandmother was probably super proud of that but and my mother turned out to be a computer programmer back in the 70s and she was trained by IBM and uh, she got got the shot at the position because she was a bookkeeper and she knew how to run the old what are they Remington Rand accounting machines you know with the punched cards and everything and when they decided to automate and go with a mainframe computer for the billing and payroll for the hospital she worked at they gave her the first dibs of uh, getting the job and she of course jumped on it because my mother was always a very technical minded person she still is at almost 90 years old now <laughs> but uh, she uh, she was trained by IBM and I kind of grew up at her knee and she would take me in the data center and big huge IBM started out with a system 3 computer uh, you could look that up look up IBM system 3 Wow, what an amazing thing when you're a small child uh, to see all that. <laughs> the great big disk drive that was the size of a, a washing machine <laughs> that you wash your clothes in. And a <laughs> printer that was enormous, you know. And uh, <clears throat> you that tractor feed paper. It was called a line printer. Some pretty amazing things back then. But anyway... Uh, my grandmother was a smart woman and uh, it's a shame she never got to live out her dream but you know she had five kids and had a wonderful family <clears throat> and all of her kids and grandkids were highly successful so I guess she won that battle in the long run alright let's go back to where we were here Okay, I'm going to turn on the power and let me turn this on. Well, that looks good so far. It's only drawing about 100 milliamps altogether, which I would think is pretty reasonable. Uh, let me connect my scope back up because we're not going to see much without that now, are we? See if I can electrocute myself while I do this. Wouldn't be the first time. Okay. And. I am not seeing anything coming out of this thing. So I am it's not oscillating. Nope. Nothing. Bumpkiss. We are getting bumpkiss. Let's see here. scope works nothing so she won't oscillate so let's try to find out why now now we'll have to go in and fix it okay I have it turned on and with 117 volts in you should have or no they they only want 110 volts across the coil 
So let's take a look at the, or across the primary of the transformer. So let's look at that first, because I think that's where we need to start. Let's see. And we're high. You can see it's 122. So I'm going to have to reduce that. So let me turn this off for a minute. I don't know if I'm going to be able to hold this on here. And we're going to reduce this. There's 110, right? Okay. So we can follow along with the schematic, right? So now let's see what voltage we have. And if we're way off, It's 136 volts, and they're saying they want 125, so we're about 10 volts high. And that 10 volts would be the voltage drop you would get from this selenium rectifier. So technically, we could put uh, an additional resistor in line with the, you know, with the diode and Let's first look at what kind of current draw we have here. So this is a 2.2K resistor, and we have 11.5 volts across that 2.2K. All right, so 11.5 divided by 2200. So we're only looking at about 5 milliamps of current. So 5 milliamps of current, we want to drop, what, what did we say we wanted to drop? At 5 milliamps of current, whoop, let me reset that. We wanted to drop about 10 volts or so. So, okay. So we want 10 volts divided by 5 milliamps. So it's saying we have, we have to add about another 2K resistor in there. Okay, the power supply is now complete and I added another 2.2K uh, 2 .2 resistor in there. And I did not put a capacitor because I, I actually want this to drop the voltage. Now, it's still a little bit high, and it will be because, believe it or not, this thing draws incredibly low current until the oscillator starts running. I may have to change this. At this point in time, the oscillator will not run. And uh, I've, I've got the 400 hertz oscillator for the audio, but the RF oscillator is not working. And it's not a power problem went through and checked all that. So if we move down to the schematic, and the schematic is actually on two pages here. I'll kind of stick them together so that we can view it kind of how it should be. How's that? You can see that the schematic it can be a little bit confusing the way it's laid out. So you know my rule. Whenever I look at something and it kind of jumps around on the page, sometimes I will take the time to redraw it so I can get a better mental picture of what they're doing. So that's exactly what I did here. I just took this and just kind of hand drew a schematic. I'll zoom it in a little bit. There we go. So what's happening here is if I can find my pointer. You have this, this is kind of your modulation uh, tube up here. And what's happening is your B plus comes in and their voltage divider biasing it. So you see there's 470K and 270K and provided that there's 110 volts, which that's always going to be much higher because 
our modern power is no longer 110 volts, it's 125 volts. So this voltage will be much higher. Still doesn't matter because the math still works out. As long as the tubes can handle the, the extra voltage, it won't matter. Which is why we may even be able to remove that dropping resistor later on after we experiment a little bit. You're still going to be well within the limits of these tubes. So provided there's 110 volts, that'll give us about 40 volts at the grid here, which should bias this tube. And what they're saying is you should have about 54 volts approximately at this point. And if you look the way this is biased, you have the grid pulled to ground uh, through your 22K resistor. There's no signal coming in here unless the oscillator is operating. And this cathode follower tube right here should be turned partially on. And that's what's going to provide this 54 volts. It's also going to provide feedback through this coil and you have your adjustable capacitor, which is that's the tuning cap on the front for the frequency select, or, you know, for frequency adjustment. And you can see I put the dotted lines. These are L2 through 7. So depending on what frequency band you select, it will bring in a different coil. And all it does is change the inductance of the coil. So this is your actual oscillator right here, but the oscillator cannot work until we get that initial bias right here to feed everything. Because you can see the path, that 54 volts comes through this 4.7K resistor into the coil, goes through half of the coil, and that's what provides the power, the B plus, for this tube right here, the oscillator tube. And without that, none of this will operate, and we're not getting that right here. So what we need to do is we need to check this line down here to make sure that everything is where it should be. Now, we can check voltages. We can also check resistances. And that's kind of where we're going to start. We're going to go through and measure these resistors. Now, we initially checked them, and they were kind of intolerance. Some of them were very well intolerance. Uh, really up at the top is where I didn't check very closely. This 270 and 470 are pretty close. So I think we're good here. And I, and I did, in fact, measure, and there is voltage right here. So let's go to the top side of this chassis and look at these. OK, here's the top of the tube socket. And just to kind of orient ourselves, if we go back to this, you can see we have your the, the modulation tube below, and then it comes up, and there's a purple wire that goes up to here, and then you can see off of the grid you should have a 22K, and then here you should have a 68 ohm going to your uh, attenuator pot. So looking here, here's your purple wire. So right there is where should be the 57 uh, volts, or 54 volts, or whatever it is. And that goes up to that 4.7K that goes to your coils, which will provide B plus for the other half <laughs> of that circuit, which is going to be um, where at on the, let's see, was it pin 6, which is over. 9, 8, 7, so right out in here somewhere. So let's check those resistances real quick. Okay, back up, move this back here. Look at that, I can get everything in shot. Kind of starting to like this new camera setup. It's a little awkward at first figuring it out. I'm going to kind of the workflow here, but it is working. So there's a convenient little ground tab right here we're going to grab one too. We can see it around here. Let me get some light because I can't see. The camera makes everything look brighter than it actually is in real life. It's a great camera for that. Okay. And from ground, 
first thing we want to check is this 22K. And that would be this one right here. And it's about 21K. And there's, pulling the tube out won't change anything. That's just that's where that is. So it's actually reading a little bit low, if anything, but that's fine. It's these are 20%. They don't have any silver or gold band on them. So if there's no no uh, tolerance band, they're 20%. So that's well within the 20%. In other words, they're not really concerned about any of this. How close they are in certain instances. This one here, again, very close to 22K, so that's a good resistor. Now this 4.7K, it is 6K. That's a little bit high. I would say that's out of tolerance. Let's, let's see what that should be. So 4,700 times 1.2, 5,600 would be 20%, or 5,640. So it's more than 20% out. And again, this feeds that circuit there. Okay, as we found earlier, this 4.7K resistor was reading way high. It's reading 6K. So I replaced it with a metal oxide 4.7K up here. <laughs> and I didn't really think it was going to make any difference, but now I have 35 volts there where we had zero before. So now I think we might be getting close to getting this thing to oscillate. So now we need to see if the oscillator is now has now woke up and started to work, but I would have never guessed that that little difference in that resistor would have made all that big of a change, but sure enough, there it is. It did. Okay, we have the scope hooked up in an improper way. <laughs> However, check it out. We have a waveform. And uh, that flat topping is, is what it's supposed to do. That's actually a very good waveform for this because by having that, that clip like that, having that distorted waveform, that distortion actually causes the harmonics that gives you the upper frequency bands. Without that, you wouldn't have that. All of these old style signal generators are designed like that. So a stupid resistor caused all that trouble. Now why did I use a metal oxide resistor? You have, this is very important. When you're working with anything with high frequency, the resistor type that you use can and will affect the performance of the circuit. So what do I mean by that? Well, what that means is that these old carbon comp resistors are literally powdered carbon that is compressed together and that's what creates the resistance but there's no reactive component to it at all. Whenever you go to these newer resistors, and I have one right here, this would be called a carbon film resistor and there are also metal film resistors. Any of these film resistors they actually make a, a film inside there and then they cut a spiral pattern around it to give you the appropriate resistance for the for whatever value they were trying to, to make. The problem is that spiral in there, while at low frequencies, doesn't really make any difference. As you get to the much higher frequencies, they act almost like an inductor and they can affect the signal. Whereas a metal oxide resistor is completely non-inductive or for most intents and purposes is non-inductive. Of course, everything has inductance. Even the leads on the resistor itself have inductance. But uh, that's neither here nor there. Anyway, it worked. So all it was was that resistor and now everything's good. So let's uh, continue on now and see if we can pick up any sound on our uh, receiver. Okay, I have the signal generator set at 900 kilohertz because we're on the B band. 
I have the power set to maximum. I have it set to AF modulation. So you'll have that 400 hertz modulation and I'm doing about, oh, we're set to about 25 here. That should be enough and we have our handy dandy Panasonic. And there's all kinds of crap on the bench we're gonna hear now. So 900 is going to be right between this 80 and 100. So let's see. There it is. Modulation off. Modulation on. So it's fixed. Isn't that cool? <clears throat> so Going back to our schematic, this 4.7K is very critical to the circuit. So this won't start up and won't give you that loop if this is the wrong value. So I thought that being you know 1K high, even though it wouldn't be right, I didn't think it would make a big difference, especially because this is a 20% resistor, but that was more than 20% out. So that value is a little more critical uh, than I originally thought. That was holding the whole thing down and preventing it from oscillating. I also drew the modulation circuit in here for the audio. And that's just the audio oscillator and then this is your modulator up here. So there it is and it is working. So now we can uh, finish cleaning things up. While we were in here, I decided that I would check this uh, 68 ohm resistor right here that goes down to this 200 ohm. Now this pot is reading high. It's reading probably about 215, 220. Not real high, but it's off a little bit. This, however, is one of those roundies, which when you see these kind of Bakelite looking ones with the rounded edges and they're a little bit narrower than the Allen Bradley types. These ones tend to fail more quickly than these squared off ones like this. So what I'm doing is this is a 68 ohm. I have a good carbon comp 62 ohm which kind of will offset a little bit that pot being a little bit high. And let's just check this old one and see what it's like. So again, this was a 68 ohm. Connect it up. And you can see, <laughs> yeah, it's reading 90 ohms. So it really needed to be replaced. And you can see this 61 ohm is right at 62. So it's, it's a, well, it is a new one. It's brand new. And this one, 20% tolerance for this one. This one is a 5%. So it should be, this should last as long as I need it to anyway. What do you think? So let's get some sleeving and put on there. And we'll get that installed. Okay, now that we have this working, uh, we're going to make it a little bit more <laughs> user friendly. This old microphone connection that they had in the old days uh, was very common, but today you hardly ever see these connectors. So what we're going to do is we're going to remove this and replace it with a, just a standard BNC connector, which is very easy on these because they have this pretty much the same mounting hole size and it's just this single wire right here so we'll do that and uh, we'll be right back okay when you take these out you'll see that they are press fit in there with these little teeth and it's round and the new connector that you will want to put in you can see they're kind of they have two flat spots on the ends I'll show you real quick this is how most of these BNC connectors are. You see, so there's a flat end here and a flat end there. 
When you put them in there, they fit perfectly in the hole, and that'll work just fine. But you really have to tighten them down hard, and even with that, from the pressing and turning of putting them in and out, they always loosen up. It drives me crazy. Uh, and there's ways around that, but you can put a, some solder on them, you know, on the copper chassis or something to keep them from turning. But since this is, I'm using this for functional rather than to be a collector's item, I'm not worried if it's 100% totally original looking. So what I'm going to do is instead of just putting this jack like this, I'm going to use one of these that has the mounting flange and it has four little holes and that's going to mount very sturdy on there and it's not going to move. It's also going to give you four nice ground points that will be nice and tight. So that's what I'm going to do and I'll be right back. Okay, we're going to do take two on this same clip because I just realized on the last time I recorded it, my lapel microphone, the, the built-in battery on it died. And it's a USB rechargeable one, so I have to wait for it to, to charge before I can use it again. So we're using a different microphone. Hopefully it sounds good. Anyway, we've replaced the connector here. And I have a cable going over to this oscilloscope. And this scope's very capable of measuring the uh, direct frequency all, all the way up. Because <laughs> this is a 500 megahertz scope and 5 giga sample sample rate. And we won't get into all of that, how that works. Suffice it to say that a 500 megahertz scope, that doesn't necessarily mean you can look at 500 megahertz. It might be less, it might be more. It depends on the scope and a whole bunch of the features and how you're having it set up. We're not going to worry about that. Let's just say we can look at it. And what we're looking at right now is a 455 kilohertz, which is a very popular frequency we use with these little signal generators. And you can see it is a distorted waveform. That is by design. I get so many... I see so many forums where people talk about their signal generators not making a pure sine wave on RF. And I know you're used to seeing, you know, the HP, you know, the 8657, you know, up here. And, you know, talking about how it always puts out a really nice looking waveform. But this is different. The way that this thing achieves the higher bands. So if you look at this. It has A, B, C, D, E, and then two Fs. And the way this thing achieves that such a wide frequency band, clear up into the VHF, this is pretty high, 435 megahertz. The way they do that is through harmonics. If you had a pure sine wave, you would not have harmonics. So again, that's why this by design has a distorted sine wave. That is by design. Now, you might say to yourself, well, the harmonics are only used at the higher bands, so why is, does this have a distorted waveform at the lower bands? Well, this is a very simple Colpitts oscillator type uh, signal generator. And to have two separate oscillators, one that would create a clear you know a clean sine wave and another one that would have a distorted one for the upper bands just doesn't make sense and you don't have to have a perfect sine wave for a carrier rf is completely different than audio and i think a lot of audio folks don't all know that or don't understand that all you need is a consistent period in between each cycle to be a good carrier. It doesn't really care about how distorted. That could be a complete square wave and you would still have a perfect carrier signal at 455 kilohertz. And when you modulate it, the modulation, that has to be very pure. If you want a really undistorted sine wave, you have to put a very undistorted sine wave into the modulation. That's completely different than the carrier. So 
anytime you see any of these old style signal generators, even the solid state ones, they're going to have this. Uh, it's just the way they're designed. So I hope that clears that up. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to do a little modification to this. Uh, the first thing is if we look at the signal, it's not really super strong. It's a pretty decent output. But what I would like to do is I want to put another output jack on this signal generator. And I want it to be there for two purposes. Number one, I would like to be able to connect a frequency counter so that we can actually have, have a device that can measure the frequency. And I also would like to have a little bit stronger signal output to drive things like a frequency counter or if you're driving it into a terminated signal you know like 50 a 50 ohm termination or something I'd like to have a little bit higher output that will not be adjustable by the way well it might be maybe I will connect it to the adjustable output but that way we should have enough signal strength well it's going to be unadjusted because it has to be strong enough that even when I have my signal turned way down, like we're setting up the front end of a, of a receiver, I want a strong enough signal for the frequency counter to be able to lock on to it. So there's two ways we can do this. Okay, the first way we could handle this would be to come right out here with another capacitor. See this coupling capacitor here? We can add another capacitor up here right here at the top of the of the pot where it goes into the pot and we can just branch that off into a BNC connector and that would work just fine that should be good or we're gonna try a little experiment on ours and we're gonna add one of these and this is called a broadband amplifier a linear amplifier it runs on 5 volts so we can create the 5 volts from our uh, filament supply hopefully we're gonna look into that a little bit and it will amplify everything from all the way down to about a hundred kilohertz all the way up to this one will go up to 500 megahertz now when you purchase these there are many different ones out there if you just go onto eBay or, or Amazon or AliExpress whatever and just randomly buy one they all look like this but they don't all work like this. Now I showed you the one I keep on the bench and that's this one right here. This one will go up to 2 gigahertz. This is even better. All right, But we don't need this for this application. This smaller one will actually work fine. But let me show you something else. So here's another one. Let's look at it. And you can see it's even smaller physically than this one. However, this one will only work down to about a hundred, little, little over a hundred kilohertz, or you know, higher. Most of them will work at one megahertz. So this one, yeah, this one only works at one megahertz up. So anything below one megahertz, it will actually attenuate the signal or not pass it at all. So you have to watch when you buy these LNAs, these low noise amplifiers, they have a frequency range in which they will work. A lot of them will go up very high, much higher than your signal generator, but they won't go down low enough. So when you go and do your Google search or your eBay search or whatever you do, make sure it specifically says it can go down to either DC or to 100 kilohertz. You'll find out there's very few of them available that will go below one megahertz. So make sure you, and the price isn't any different, it's just that some of them will not work. And even though these are, uh, you know, they tell you it's a 32 dB gain, I think this one's a 20 dB gain or something like that. Um, it does, that, that gain tapers off at the lower and higher bands of the frequency on this. So. It's not perfectly linear, but it's pretty close. Again, we don't really care on something like this because really there is no calibrated output on them. 
we just want to amplify the signal a little bit and you want it to work within the bands that this thing functions so this one will work just fine I think I got this I have a whole box full of different ones that I've accumulated over the years um, and I none of them cost more than twenty dollars US and most of them cost around fifteen dollars or so so that's what you can expect to pay uh, I'm sure there's some that cost more and less and I, with the times as they are now if you went to buy one I don't know what they go for now but I they might be a little more than that I don't know but you can find them online so we're gonna wire this in there I'll show you how this works because I have an adapter connected to it and if we take this and connect it right in to here so this is basically just going in line with the signal okay and then we'll hook up a 5 volt power supply to it and there's your signal so you can see so let me zoom in alright now that's with the amplifier in line let's disconnect it and just connect the, the scope directly to the output of the signal generator and you can see it's the amplitude is lower so it does amplify the signal okay plugging it back in so you can see it gives it a nice boost and that's what we're looking for and you know as I go down the line here to higher frequencies so we're looking at 5 megahertz now and there we go we had to set my scope there so there's 35 megahertz and we're on the the E scale right now which is 11 to 37 megahertz and if we put our amplifier back in there puts quite a boost on it and then if we go to the last one there we go and that is 121 megahertz and you can see it's starting to get more of a sine wave now and to get above that you're actually looking you want to actually you'll be looking at the harmonics which the harmonics are going to be you're not going to be able to trigger the scope on it. Let's see. Here's a picture of the power supply once again. And if you look, we have two windings. We have a high voltage winding, which is 110 volts, and we have this 6.3 volt winding that controls the filaments. Now, what we need to do is we need a 5 volt supply to drive this. You can see it just says 5 volts so what we're going to do is we're going to use this 6.3 volt winding to give us our 5 volts and we're going to make a very simple but effective power supply now this thing under full load only requires about 50 milliamps it's very low current so we're going to be able to get away with this normally you do not want to put too much extra on these because these tiny little transformers in this test equipment are barely designed to handle the current uh, you know that they that they need to, to deliver but in this instance 50 milliamps isn't going to hurt us and even if it does we can remove this one type 47 bulb I think that's what this is Let's see L1 or no I1 bulb yep it's a type 47 bulb so you can see that right there bulb 47 and replace that with an LED uh, lamp and then that would give us the extra current so and I might do that I'm not sure anyway here's what we're gonna do we're gonna do a very simple and effective power supply and there it is so it consists of a single diode so it's a half wave rectifier and a little pi network and a 5 volt Zener diode regulator now you might say well all oh, the ripples terrible you know well no it really isn't the reason that we can make radio circuits for instance most of the AM radios from the old days they use a half wave rectified power supply and the way they do that is if it's very very low current which is what this is you'll never draw down on the capacitor bank enough as long as you design this properly to get ripple 
So what we're doing is we're taking and we're half wave rectifying that 6.3 volts. We're referencing it to ground because if you remember this winding is tied to ground. And then we're going through a Pi network. So we have a 470 microfarad capacitor. You see there. And it's to ground. Then we go through this resistor which is a 27 ohm resistor. And then we have another 470 microfarad only at 6.3 volts. And this is, makes what's called a Pi network. And then at the end of it we have our 5.1 volt Zener diode. And then on the other end where this plugs in I made a connector that will plug right into here and I put one of these little polymer capacitors which happens to be if I can focus on it a 2200 microfarad at 6.3 volts so between that 2200 and this 470 and this Pi network with this very specifically chosen <laughs> resistor value we're going to get what I think is going to be a nice stable power supply so let's plug this in I'll back you up and let's connect it okay I have everything connected except the red lead to the positive lead to the little preamp and I'm going to plug the preamp in so that it can actually operate with a signal going into it just like this and let's plug it in and see what we get now I have the voltmeter connected across the output of our little makeshift power supply and there it is 4.98 volts it's right about 5 volts and if we put a full load on it and we'll connect this only drops down about a couple of millivolts so we have a nice solid power supply you can see the LED is lit so it's on and working and if we go down to look at the amount of ripple it's only about 11 millivolts of ripple just under 12 millivolts and that's more than suitable for this and that's all you need Okay, I've removed the incandescent number 47 bulb and replaced it with this LED and you will see that it has more than sufficient brightness as you can see very bright to light up the faceplate so that's going to buy us some more current because <laughs> these draw a lot less current only a few milliamps versus whatever a 47 bulb I'd have to look it up but it's a lot more well the deed is done you can see I used one of the mounting holes from the transformer for this one and I just had to drill one small hole right here for the other side I use these two cables and you can buy packs of like five of these on eBay or whatever and they're just th these little SMA connectors and just cut the end off of one end. They're actually not that expensive. I mounted the connector right here. And of course the power supply is mounted under here. And I used the existing screw hole for that. And I just tapped right off the back of the light bulb socket. And that's a perfect place to get your 6.3 volts. And you can see everything's working. So now let's connect it up and see if it will actually make a signal. Okay, we'll go up here. I'll back this up to try to get everything in the scene. There we go. All right, so plug down here, and you can see there it is. Now this is with a high impedance input. I can terminate this scope at 
50 ohms to simulate a 50 ohm load for like a radio and you can see how much it reduces the signal and that's with maximum signal all the way up so turn it up a little bit now let's go over to the other signal and we're still ter terminated at 50 ohms now let's go to the amplified output and you can see it is much nicer much higher uh, amplitude and that's what we want and this one is not affected by the amplitude selection but this one however is and you can see perfect now the nice thing about this is we can disconnect this and we can go up now to our frequency counter okay I now have it connected to the amplified output and we're connected to our frequency counter and you can see very clearly 25 megahertz and I can dial this here which wherever I want and you can see it's very sensitive that's about all I can get right there with that knob and looking at the scale it's off a little bit so we need to adjust it it's off by one megahertz so I'm going to put this right on the graticule for 25 megahertz. Okay, so I had to turn the manual trigger level on because the harmonics are actually triggering it. If I turn the level off, you can see it's showing about double and it's picking up the, the the second harmonic and if I go and set that to manual triggering and adjust the trigger so it just triggers off the top of the peak now we get a good reading so with this particular frequency counter it's very sensitive to that so now we can see we're reading a little bit high so we're gonna have to adjust it and we're spot on there we go simple as that and all I'm doing here is rotating this one here but each one of these starts from the lowest band to the highest band and you just adjust those slugs to get it to come in. Okay, we're all put back together. And, uh, well, I have to mention this too. If you look at the, how this is, how the polarity is on this, watch what happens. Yep, it inverts it. So you can see You see the, the distorted part is on the top, on the amplified one and the non-amplified. You can see it's on the bottom. So that little amplifier actually inverts the phase. So <laughs> you'd want to be careful if you're, you don't want to use both of those outputs on the same circuit or you'll have problems, right? So, but it is good for just using it uh, them individually or using one to connect to your to your frequency counter or your scope and the other one to connect to the device under test but that's just something you want to remember uh, and I don't know if all of these LNA modules invert the signal or not but that one actually actually does and it's something you want to be aware of 
so that's it for this one um, what what a video this was quite quite the long video but it was a lot of fun to do I enjoyed the project so until next time I wish you all peace joy happiness and good health in your lives we'll see you again real soon with more projects and uh, more to come take care everybody bye bye